and IAU webinar in the mini series organized together with the Center for International Higher Education from the Boston College, um, a seminar on the future of higher education, uh, the short, the medium, and the long-term perspectives in mid, and, uh, mid to low income countries. Um, so good morning to everyone, or good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you're based. Um, I welcome you to this webinar and hope you're all safe and well wherever you are. IU is thrilled to co-organize this mini-series with Boston College, the Center for International Higher Education, and in particular with Hans de Witt, who will appear on the screen as soon as I disappear. Um, we're pleased to organize it from the IU side, in particular with Giorgio Marinoni, who's the manager of internationalization, of course. and with Ekaterina Minaiva from the High School of Economics in Moscow, working with IAU long time. So what we will do uh, is discuss and debate and to, in order to learn more about the impacts of COVID-19 on higher education around the world, but also to analyze what the contributions are from higher education to address the different challenges that we face today and into the future. The webinars are uh, a series of three. Uh, they are connected and disconnected. They present different perspectives from around the world. And you will be able to see and, uh, and revision re uh, these webinars because they, have been, uh, they will be recorded or have been recorded. The first webinar took last, place last week and featured Ellen Hazelcorn, higher education specialist from Dublin, Roberta Malibasset from the World Bank, and Ahmed Bawa from uh, University of South Africa in South Africa. The recordings of the webinars have to be edited a bit each time we have a webinar, but they will be made available on the IAU and Boston College YouTube channels for you to, to watch again uh, at your leisure. The third um, webinar in the series will take place next week, and it will uh, focus more specifically on the future of internationalization of higher education, also one of the very aspects of higher education hard hit by uh, the, um, uh, the pandemic that we now all experience around the world. Today we're very pleased to give the floor to three eminent speakers from three continents. First to Marcello Knobel, who's the rector of University of Campinas in Brazil. Then to Eden Wong, who's the president of the Asian Institute of Technology in Thailand. And the third speaker is Wundwusen Tamarat, who's the president and founder of St. Mary's University in Ethiopia. And I give the floor to Hans de Witt uh, for what I believe will be, again, a very stimulating debate. Thank you. Talk to you later. Okay, good uh, afternoon, morning or evening, depending on where you are all. Uh, uh, and uh, we're looking forward to uh, the presentations uh, during the second webinar. As has been said before, uh, we had last week a webinar uh, focusing more on higher education in general and the impact of COVID-19. Uh, and several, of course, aspects came also uh, ar around that discussion about what are the implications for more the developed uh, of the high income countries and what are the implications for mid and low income countries and uh, we thought it was very important to address also specifically what is happening in the global south uh, and uh, uh, see what are not only the challenges but maybe also the opportunities that this creates and uh, as Hilje said we have three excellent speakers to uh, discuss this and uh, um, when they are finished I will ask them maybe one or two questions and then in the meantime, we ask you to uh, ask questions in the chat uh, so that uh, we can moderate that. And uh, uh, Hilke will keep an eye on uh, the questions and then make a selection of the questions that you have been postponed uh, to ask to uh, the three presenters. Uh, uh, last week, that worked very well. We had a lot of questions and uh, that resulted in a very interesting debate. Uh, so we start first with uh, Marcelo Noble, Rector of University of Campinas in Brazil, who um, 
will describe um, the context of his university, Brazil, and I hope maybe also can say something about how representative Brazil is maybe also for the rest of Latin America, but his focus will be in particular on Campinas and Brazil. Uh, so the floor is yours, uh, Marcelo, for your introduction. Thank you. You're muted. Okay, yeah, now, now I'm fine. Uh, so thank you very much for this kind invitation. It's a pleasure to talk to you all around the world. Here in Brazil, it's uh, yet the beginning of the morning. So uh, good morning to everyone. So uh, I will try to be really short in order to give a uh, floor for debate, which is uh, really important in this, in this conference, as I would say. I will try to sh show you a little bit of, uh, of our concerns, of course, in this uh, perspectives of uh, in this uh, COVID times, and uh, it's uh, interesting to to see uh, how it will uh, shape the face of education around the world. Some people are saying that is uh, they are not uh, allowed to to hear, but I, I believe most of the people are hearing well. So. <laughs> Uh, let me just start by showing this uh, worry uh, graph. I, I, I pictured here Brazil, Thailand, and uh, Ethiopia. As we are the speakers here. So in Brazil, <laughs> unfortunately, we are reaching a very uh, bad level of uh, uh, death, unfortunately, on um, COVID. All the countries are still uh, increasing. We didn't uh, reach the maximum yet. And in Brazil, the pace of, of uh, in, uh, growth of this uh, uh, pandemic is, is rather strong. Uh, the problem is that we really, really uh, have a really bad policies in terms of country uh, regarding uh, higher education and uh, not only higher education, of course, the, all the, the pandemic situation uh, around the, the country. Let me uh, show you a little bit of uh, the initiatives that we, we made at the university level. And we, uh, uh, I, I will present initially my university, of course. Uh, the University of Campinas is a rather young university founded in 66. Uh, uh, it's a public university. Uh, in uh, from the state of Sao Paulo, which is one of the wealthiest states in, in Brazil. Next, please. The university uh, has uh, six campuses, uh, 24 schools. We have uh, around uh, uh, 35,000 students. Half of them are graduate students and half of them are undergraduate students. And we have around uh, three hospitals. We have, uh, in fact, more than that, but uh, it's around 900 beds. Uh, we have uh, 2,000 faculty uh, members. Next. And the, uh, well, this is a little bit more of the, of the academic community. We have uh, 20,000 undergrads, uh, 17,000 uh, graduate students. So it's a rather research intensive university and we have also two schools we have more than 3000 high schools uh, students so let next we have a, a very big health area so we have uh, several centers and, and a big hospital with high complexity in the uh, in the area of, of brazil we we reach a, an area of about 6.5 million people with our hospital which is completely free for everyone. So it's a, a, a public hospital area. Next. And uh, well, this is the number of beds and the uh, medical consultations and so on. So ju just to show that our uh, presence here in, 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 in the region is really important from the point of view of this uh, pandemic. Next. What uh, happened when, uh... next one, please. Uh, the, when uh, we decided 
é, to to well uh, there was an, another one first uh, Ekaterina please sorry uh, the previous one please okay uh, in Brazil uh, no no yes this one yeah. okay thank you uh, in Brazil we faced in the recent years a very strong attack to the universities especially the public ones and uh, uh, paradoxically in this period of, of, of coronavirus uh, we, we have been facing a, a, a change in the public perception of higher education and science most of the people now realize that the public uh, the institutions like our higher education are really really important for the future of humanity for the future of society and uh, this is a, a, a quite a striking point of this uh, pandemic we were in fact the first brazilian university to suspend non-essential on-site activities and uh, on march 12 2020 next one please And uh, of, of course, we when we decided to do that, uh, we faced a, a series of unprecedented problems, probably that are shared with many universities around the world. How to change the system based mainly on classrooms uh, teaching uh, to online system without uh, within a few days, how to deal with students without financial resources, how to support teachers, how to maintain the quality of excellence of our courses, how to maintain the quality uh, how to evaluate students, how not to leave anyone behind. So the, the idea, of course, is we try to face each single challenge point by point. And one important word in this process was the word flexibility. We tried to, to, to reach a level of flexibility at the university, which is rather rigid here in Brazil and in Latin America as a whole, and, and try to to make it less rigid in terms of contents, in terms of, of grades, in terms of uh, evaluation and so on. Trying to show to faculty members and to students that we are facing indeed a really unusual and unprecedented situation. So next one, please. Uh, so uh, just to finish and to show, and I can discuss this uh, afterwards, uh, we tried to, to make several initi initiatives uh, after the challenge of the pandemic. So the first one, of course, uh, we have a, a rather uh, strong uh, inequalities in the student body. So we tried to support our poorer students. We, com we gave com them computers, tablets, internet connections. We bought uh, internet connections for more than 500 students. Uh, we gave more than 2,000 emergency scholarships for the students to really uh, try to buy uh, uh, computers and internet connections. We uh, started from scratch, from nothing, uh, 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 organization of donations and volunteers in Brazil. We don't have the philanthropy uh, culture that exists in other countries. And we started from the beginning to, to do that. We uh, organized all the health area, trying to, 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 to deal with COVID-19 patients. We have uh, 36 ICU beds now, uh, 84 beds for a, in infirmary and so on. Uh, we started a research COVID-19 task force uh, for, for providing tests, ventilators, epidemiology, and so on and so on. Uh, we also are very much worried about the issue of uh, the economic impact of uh, of this uh, of this situation. So we established a group to stu to study scenarios for the future, direct measures to reduce the financial impact. We depend here in Brazil in the in our model of financing. We depend so much on the on the uh, on the tax revenues of the state, and the tax revenue went down really strongly, and we now. They, uh, made a lot of uh, a lot of direct measures to reduce the financial impact for the university. I can discuss this later. And of course, many initiatives to help society. Uh, we started active listening for lonely people, science blogs, webinar podcasts, uh, 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 frequently asked questions, phone uh, uh, dealt by students 
regarding the, the, the disease, uh, online cultural events, and so on. So we, uh, as a whole, try to keep the university working, functioning for, for uh, our mission, which is to serve society. And this is quite important in these times of, uh, of, uh, of this pandemic. We really don't know the future. We don't know what is going to happen. But in my opinion, we should keep and work with the mission of each university in hand in order to guide us for the future. So this is all. Thank you very much. Uh, next one, please. Just my, my contact if you want uh, further information after this uh, webinar. Thank you very much for this uh, opportunity again. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Marcelo, for giving this context. Uh, we probably come back to you uh, in the discussion at the end of the presentation with some uh, further questions on, uh, of course, you said the future is still uncertain, but I know from discussions that we had that you have ideas about what can be the opportunities we learn from this crisis. So maybe in, we start the discussion later on to all three of you to, to address that. In the meantime, before giving the floor to uh, one wasn't Tamarat from Ethiopia, uh, don't hesitate to put questions in the chat. I think now most of the technical problems have been solved, uh, as I see that well. So uh, maybe uh, put in the questions so that we can uh, stimulate the discussion based on your input uh, to uh, the panelists. Uh, the floor now is to uh, Wand Watson. Uh, Kajta, can you put on the, the PowerPoint the next slide? Hello. Hello. I hope you can hear me now. Yes, we can. Okay, the first one, please. Uh, greetings to you all. Thank you for the opportunity. Uh, I'll be talking about uh, three major uh, areas, which would eventually bring us to the impact of the COVID-19 on Ethiopian higher education and relatively on African higher education as well. So I'll be, I'll be uh, putting the African experience with the Ethiopian experience and the institutional experience as well. Can we go to the next slide, please? For those of you who, who might have a very uh, tiny idea of where Ethiopia is, this is uh, the second populous, most populous country in Africa, East Africa, uh, fast growing economy, actually uh, one of the fastest growing economies globally. Education has been uh, extremely a uh, focus area in the last uh, two decades in this country. And the higher education setup has had uh, very recently 50 public universities, 250 private institutions, and nearly 1 million students. It's essentially a public dominated system, though I come from a private higher education sector. The private higher education sector is a, rel a relatively weak sector, essentially for profit, owned by families and generates uh, income mainly from, from students. This is somehow very similar to the African context, I would say, where education has been focused, where economic development for the last two decades have been very, very positive. It's in the midst of all this positive development that the coronavirus epidemic uh, pandemic arrived. And in terms of addressing the pandemic, three major areas have been the common areas, whichever uh, direction you go to, that have been focused by the government and educational institutions. One is related to protecting lives and livelihoods, which is more into the health sector, but still uh, was expected to be addressed by uh, institutions, private or public. Protecting economic impact of pandemic, government has been putting a lot of effort into this, but private institutions have also been working a lot towards this. The school closure has affected uh, 10 million students, 2,000 uh, higher education institutions all over Africa, Within Ethiopia, 250 plus 50 institutions. Next, please. Next, please. Uh, the implications uh, will, will, will give you the responses as well. The first realization you will have is uh, that institutions have had too many institutional responsibilities to address at one go. And most of these have been related to supporting the community, the online education, and institutional con continuity. Now, as regards to the uh, support of the community, institutions were responsible for their own staff, students, creating awareness, and they were also responsible for the greater uh, society, I would say, the community. And African universities, including Ethiopian universities and that of mine, have been very, very much actively involved in terms of public awareness, 
uh, doing relevant research, uh, uh, serving as testing and medical sites, uh, serving as quarantine and storage services, and uh, surprisingly, in the production of health and sanitary items, masks, medical apparels as well. They have shifted almost all their resources to tackling the effects of the pandemic. The second one is online education. Uh, uh, Marcelo has al already said uh, a lot about the challenges. I will not capitalize on that. But Africa has been on the uh, problematic end, I would say, due to problems related to access, related to cost, technology, expertise, even attitude, I would say, uh, which have influenced uh, the way that we've been doing. I would say that we are struggling, but this sudden shift has not been without problems, I would say. The third one is related to institutional continuity. Uh, many institutions, including mine, are trying to, to address the pandemic, uh, which means that we have been focusing on immediate impacts of the pandemic rather than following uh, institutional calendars or following the uh, previous plans of the institution. And this has not been as such an easy task to do. So the transition has not been simple. The financial weasel has been uh, questioned due to the uh, pandemic effects, and that has had a lot of effect in terms of staff output, in terms of prioritizing uh, plans and what have you. Next, please. Next, please. So the possible impacts uh, have been uh, too many, uh, but you would understand that uh, whichever level you are talking to, you are talking at, uh, you would understand that this would be determined by duration of the outbreak, the impacts of the economy, impacts on the public higher education sector as well. So in, in a small study that we did very recently, we found out that especially the private universities would not be able to survive if the pandemic continues like this for more than two to three months. That's what we understood. And the impact on the public higher education sector <clears throat> would not be as such uh, uh, economical in a way, I would say, because uh, they have been supported by the government. But the impact on economy would eventually have uh, some impacts on the public sector as well. So if you look at the short-term impacts, for instance, we have had uh, serious impacts on institutional budget, which uh, has led to some form of downsizing and closure on private institutions. Public has been uh, freezing hiring, uh, and there have also been uh, some uh, problems as regard to postponing the, the academic calendar, which is uh, affecting uh, postponing of classes, especially undergraduate classes, postponing graduations, which would have a lot of effect both on the public and the private sector, including the employability of graduates. And the digital transition also has, is having a lot of effect in terms of quality, in terms of inequity, in terms of student <coughs> satisfaction as well. In the midterm, we would uh, see that uh, the impact of the digital transition, uh, which has not been that uh, smooth, and the impact of the uh, uh, impact uh, on, on the basis of what institutions are going to do, the compensation uh, for time lost, all these would not be that easy. In the long term, in the long term, I would say that the government commitment, depending on the economic effect, which is considered to be very, very serious in the case of Africa, because Ethiopia alone has declared that uh, in order uh, to assure the economic impact, it will lead. 3 billion USD uh, at the end of 2020, which means a lot. Africa, 90 to 150 billion, which again means a lot. So if this continues, uh, we would feel that during the long term, there would be a uh, lessened uh, government support or commitment to the sector. The sectoral and the program expansions could be, could be affected. And the global support to higher education, where Africa has been uh, making a lot of strides in terms of uh, put in a lot in, in PhD education, in postgraduate education and research cooperation would seriously be hampered. Well, as Marcelo said, I would also share the uh, silver linings, uh, one or two silver linings before I close. Uh, one is that uh, there is definitely going to be a shift in the mindset, a shift in the mindset. African institutions have seen the fact that they can provide indigenous solution to an exotic problem. And that means a lot in terms of self-sufficiency, in terms of uh, regaining uh, respect uh, uh, as well. I would also say that at individual level, institutions would also begin to ask the economic and eco uh, academic models that they have been following 
are going to be put under question. So there is more, more going to be more efficiency, more uh, effectiveness, I would say. The third and the last uh, observation I have uh, about the future impact is that African institutions, including Ethiopian institutions, have proved to be frontline institutions in combating the pandemic, I would say, considering the resources that they have, considering you know, the support that they have been giving to the government and the community. So I would say that uh, in addition to what we used to say as regards to uh, higher education affecting economic development and global development uh, and economic development, I would say uh, the pandemic has created an opportunity whereby uh, there has, we have a new frontier in making a case for supporting higher education, which is ensuring the very existence of human species or lives and li livelihoods. And I think that would give uh, a high stake in terms of how government community and we ourselves should begin to think about African higher education. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, von Wosen Tamarat, for giving this perspective from Ethiopia and Africa. And I think uh, also very uh, important elements that you addressed, uh, much in line also with what uh, Marcelo Noble already said, uh, the, the, the changing perspective on the importance of uh, science and higher education uh, uh, in survival and, uh, uh, and even serving the community, which I think is an aspect that uh, in the previous uh, webinar we had not so much addressed from the developed countries, but which very clear is in uh, both your presentation and also in Marcelo's uh, presentation, the important role that you have for your community, not only in academic hospitals, as Marcelo said, but also in other aspects uh, of it. Uh, the interesting point of um, private higher education and uh, the potential danger that that private higher education sector will be the most severe. Uh, uh, affected by this crisis in the higher education sector is an important point we can maybe discuss on. Uh, and of course, the whole discussion, which we come back on uh, online education with all its pluses and its minuses, as, uh, as you both have described. So, but before getting into that discussion, I give the uh, floor to Eden Won from uh, Thailand to give us that perspective uh, from an institution which um, uh, has an important part, not only in Thailand, but it's a very international perspective as well. So the floor is yours, Eden, uh, to present your case. Um, thank you very much. And I thank uh, IAU for organizing this uh, seminar and for inviting me to uh, uh, represent Asia, as they say. Uh, but uh, I have to uh, uh, confess, uh, I, I don't want to profess to uh, uh, represent Asia since uh, we're only one university in Asia. And in fact, it's a very uh, unique uh, institution. Um, so if you look at the next slide, uh, you will see that um, uh, we are uh, uh, actually uh, a graduate institution, first of all. Secondly, we're very small. We only have 1,400 uh, students all studying for uh, either master's or PhD. Um, and if you look at uh, the left side on the, uh, uh, on the uh, uh, alumni, you will see that, uh, uh, yes, we have about 25% of our alumni from uh, uh, Thailand, uh, but uh, our alumni are from uh, many, many, many uh, developing countries uh, in uh, uh, mostly, almost uh, predominantly in uh, Asia. Uh, if you look at the upper right on the uh, student body, you will see that uh, we are, um, uh, we have, uh, uh, again, on, on the, uh, you, you will see the distribution there is 65% uh, uh, of the students are not from Thailand. So we're not a Thai university. Uh, we are a private uh, international university uh, that um, uh, is not under the, uh, uh, the, the education uh, uh, ministries in, uh, in, in Thailand. Um, but uh, we are um, so international that uh, even though we're small, uh, this COVID-19 crisis uh, really has created uh, a, a number of uh, uh, challenges uh, uh, for us. Uh, if you go to the next slide, I will just very uh, quickly go over what we did in the short term uh, when the crisis uh, uh, hit. Oh, before that, I, I just, again, once again, tell you more about AIT, uh, you know, 1,400 students, and we only have three schools, School of Engineering and Technology, 
uh, School of Environment Resources Development and School of Management. And then we have a number of outreach centers because our uh, fields uh, are mostly sustainability related and we do a lot of uh, training courses, workshops, uh, uh, you know, uh, working with government policy makers, working with the government civil servants, uh, and uh, the outreach then is a big part uh, in addition to the uh, uh, degree uh, offering part of uh, uh, AIT. And of course, we have the uh, research uh, in uh, these uh, uh, areas. So on the uh, short term then, what happened was that um, once in, uh, in the next slide, you see that uh, once in January, when the, um, uh, when the uh, uh, virus, uh, you know, the coronavirus issue uh, really became, uh, came to our uh, attention, uh, we uh, set up a uh, coronavirus task force. And the first thing we did was to really uh, bring back the um, students who were abroad because we had started a uh, move to internationalization. So what that means is that we were uh, steadily uh, sending more and more students overseas uh, for exchange, and uh, we were bringing them back. Uh, first of all, of course, there were some in China, if you remember, uh, China really, uh, uh, the situation was very serious in uh, late January and uh, uh, February. Uh, we brought those back and then Korea, uh, we had students in Korea, we had to bring them back. We had students in Japan. Uh, then we had some students in Europe who actually felt that they could stay there for a longer time. But then it turns out that in March, uh, we were bringing them back. We set up quarantine uh, uh, units on campus uh, to bring them back. Uh, and uh, lots of uh, uh, discussion uh, and also working with their faculty uh, advisor. Um, then uh, the campus closed uh, in mid-March. Okay, around the same time as the other two campuses you saw. And so the classes moved to be online, okay? Then we had a situation where uh, if we had the 1,400 students, um, and, and if you recall, uh, almost 70% of them were from outside Thailand. So what did we uh, ask them to do? Well, we chose to uh, uh, encourage them to go home, uh, but we did not force them to go home. Uh, and uh, so it turns out at the end of the day, about half went home. Uh, they went back to Nepal, went back to Sri Lanka, went back to uh, uh, Myanmar, uh, Vietnam, or uh, wherever they came from, uh, and they continued their studies uh, from home. Uh, we were worried about their internet access, uh, but it turns out that that uh, has, uh, has not been a problem, okay? And uh, so we're very pleased uh, about that. And of course, the ones who stayed and just, um, you know, worked from their, uh, uh, from their room, uh, because uh, very soon after the... Uh, uh, after the uh, uh, closure of the, of the university, uh, all these uh, uh, policies uh, and measures uh, start coming in, uh, either by the Thailand government or by AIT ourselves, because we're a self-contained uh, campus and we're very, very conscious of uh, things that we needed to do to keep the campus uh, safe. Uh, so uh, the 600 or so of, uh, students will remain, and then there is another six, 700 faculty and staff who also lived on campus. So about 1,400 uh, were here and have been here since uh, March. And we have uh, had all these uh, stringent uh, and strict measures. Uh, so to this date, uh, we just uh, uh, are very fortunate that there has been no case of uh, COVID-19 uh, on campus. And uh, uh, the ones that went home, uh, we um, you know hope that they're uh, all safe uh, also. Uh, and uh, everybody graduates on time. Everybody is graduating uh, in, um, uh, in May, uh, in about a, you know 10 days here. Uh, but unfortunately, there is no graduation uh, ceremony. Uh, so this work was really all consuming and all done mostly from home because we had to work from home. Uh, but of course, the mission essential personnel uh, were still gonna be uh, uh, going on campus uh, to serve the students and to serve the uh, uh, community. But meanwhile, the last bullet here is very important because we were conscious of the future. We had to continue to promote uh, the uh, institute uh, and recruit and market and get graduate students to uh, sign up uh, and accept uh, our offers uh, to come to AIT uh, for the August fall semester. Next slide, please. So we are now uh, transitioning uh, from the short term to the uh, midterm, 
uh, and uh, lots of uh, guidelines on how to resume office. It looks like we probably, we don't know yet, you know, with the virus, you never know, but it looks like we can go back uh, the office on June 1. Uh, Thailand's uh, situation is, is not too bad. Uh, it was not good in, uh, in March and uh, April, but of course, you know, nothing like the numbers that you see in some, uh, uh, some other countries. Uh, so far, the total number of cases in Thailand uh, is uh, 3,000, uh, and uh, uh, the death uh, rate is about 1.6%. Uh, and uh, uh, today, the number of cases in, in all of Thailand, which is a 70 million, 70 million population, uh, there are only two cases uh, in Thailand today. Of course, you know, this has to do with, uh, uh, you know, wh whatever you say about testing and et cetera. So, so again, you know, we're, we're vigilant. Uh, just uh, low numbers always better than high numbers, but uh, we are still, uh, you know, hunkering down here. Uh, but we feel that um, uh, school will be open uh, in August uh, and uh, students will be able to come, uh, provided that the uh, countries that where they're coming from uh, would allow them to come uh, or, uh, you know, Thailand would allow them, uh, you know, to come. Because, as you know, a lot of travel restrictions uh, and even Thailand would not have international flights until June, probably. Right now, there is none. Um, but we're getting ready and we're building our uh, technology platforms. And uh, just like Marcello said, we are very conscious that many faculty were thrown into this on online mode. And so we're doing all the things that we need to do in this uh, three month period in between uh, for faculty training to make sure that they can uh, do the online uh, in a much more comfortable uh, and effective uh, uh, manner. And we have some other uh, technology platforms, uh, some of which are developed by AIT. So all that will come into play because as I said, even if uh, the school is open in August, there's gonna be some students who cannot come. And so uh, for a little while, and so we now are looking probably at a hybrid uh, instruction where perhaps half the students will be residential on campus and perhaps half the students will have to uh, uh, stay in their home country and uh, do the uh, online. Um, now, in terms of exchange, I think that that's probably gonna be out for the fall semester. Uh, I do wanna point out the one bullet point on the top is that we did establish what's called, uh, we initiated this, uh, concept called the Pipeline Partnership Program. In other words, we went to our partners uh, and we wrote to them around uh, 50 around the world. Uh, and we said, look, if you're in a country with uh, a pandemic problem and you think that the top graduates that you may want from Asia uh, cannot come to your campus in the fall, uh, we will welcome to come for them to come to AIT for the fall semester. Uh, we will treat them as special student and uh, it obviously has to be in a field that is compatible with uh, what they're offering there. Uh, they, of course, can always take online, you know, with that particular uh, university. Uh, but if there is an interest, uh, we uh, we're welcome uh, uh, with open arms. Uh, they can come here and uh, study with us for a semester. And who knows? It may become even a year, uh, and then that may uh, evolve into a uh, uh, dual degree uh, possibility because our master's programs are two years. Okay. Um, so there's been uh, some enthusiasm for this. We're not looking for huge numbers, but it just gives many universities who are sitting in UK, sitting in Europe and sitting in the United States, which are the uh, worst hit right now, uh, you know, uh, a, a, a sort of a way to, to uh, uh, as they're scratching their head, wondering if this student they recruited from Shanghai uh, will be able to come uh, or a student they recruited from Sri Lanka will be able to come. Uh, this would give them a possibility uh, to have a, uh, a place to continue their study, uh, especially the laboratories, because our laboratories will be open. And that, as you know, of course, is a is a problem with, with the online uh, uh, instruction. Uh, so that's the pipeline partnership program. Going to long term, we're looking at what we need to do. The next slide uh, is that uh, uh, we uh, we were going to have to uh, uh, continue to pursue uh, with residential education, but we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna have to use this occasion. I view this uh, crisis, uh, you know, obviously is a very serious and depressing crisis, but it also creates opportunities. Um, I, I, I think that uh, residential education is a great, I'm a big believer in, uh, in, uh, in fact, all our students live on campus, work on campus and study on campus, uh, but 
we're going to have to do some creative blended learning. Uh, we're going to look at some new online, online technologies. And this is an ideal time to do this because, as you know, of course, you know, sometimes there's some resistance uh, by some faculty uh, to that. And, and now that everybody is thrown into it. And, and let's take advantage of it. So it's not just a survival uh, mode, but it's actually uh, something that we could explore for the future. Pipeline par partnership, I already talked about it. Exchanges, dual degrees, all that we're going to have to uh, uh, adapt to the new normal. Uh, and then in addition, uh, this is, I think, an important point. The third point is what about alliances? What about IAU? What about these uh, other uh, regional uh, university alliances? Uh, we go to meetings and we meet lots of people and it's extremely useful uh, and you learn a lot of things, but how can they play a more uh, concrete role uh, in terms of uh, degree giving, in terms of credits, uh, in terms of working together on research, uh, you know, things that uh, I think that people talk about it a lot uh, in the, in all the time when we meet, uh, but uh, when we go home, uh, usually uh, people just continue with their bilateral uh, partners. Uh, so I think that with this crisis, we really uh, need to pull our resources uh, uh, together so that you would have uh, students traveling mobility, maybe a little bit less, uh, but uh, their education mobility uh, should not. Uh, and then we'll continue our strategic uh, focus areas. And as you can see uh, right there, is that we're very SDG and sustainability uh, oriented. And I actually think that uh, this will be even more uh, emphasized by uh, researchers and, uh, and uh, students uh, in sustainability and also health. So looking at my last slide here, which is uh, future, okay? So what is this, uh, what is this uh, uh, as uh, educators, what is it that we should be thinking about? Well, we should be thinking about, uh, I don't have answers to these. Uh, these are things that uh, many people are asking these questions. Uh, and uh, if, if we're educators that uh, hope to be uh, uh, relevant and influential and uh, contributing uh, five years, 10 years from now, I think these are the questions that we have to, we have to seriously look at. Different ways of delivering instruction and a university experience. Different meaning of globalization. What does that mean? How do you work research together? Uh, how do you, uh, uh, you know, do exchanges, as I said, dual degrees, et cetera. Uh, research, you know, maybe has to be uh, uh, more applied and the emphasis more on sustainability and environment and nature and health. Uh, finally is uh, recognizing, this is another important point, is that universities in Asia and, and the South, if you look at the North-South, okay, I think that actually we take on added importance, okay, uh, is not just a place where Asia should not be a place where you just uh, supply students uh, to uh, uh, other continents uh, or uh, for some other uh, uh, top universities to come and set up branch campuses, okay? I think that we have to look at a, a more uh, intricate uh, partnership uh, and this sort of feeding students back and forth, uh, we're going to have to do that more. And, and to me, this is actually a, a good time uh, to look at the role that universities in, in, in Asia and, and in the South, uh, you know, can play. Uh, and the business and business model, uh, spend a lot of time, spending a lot of time, will spend a lot of time uh, on uh, the uh, money situation, uh, the deficit, uh, the uh, cut in expenses, the, uh, uh, the um, uh, maintaining the, uh, the income stream, all that are big headaches for university administration. And, and we spend a lot of time uh, with the board uh, and also with the staff uh, and the ordinary employee on this issue. Uh, in conclusion, I personally think there is no more business as usual. There's no such thing as after COVID-19, let's just uh, meet and do the same thing we did in January uh, or in December of uh, 2019. Uh, but again, as I said earlier, this is a good opportunity for higher education to transform itself. And I think that uh, if we don't transform ourselves, uh, you know, we'll go by the wayside. And, uh, and let's take this uh, opportunity and, uh, and work together and, and change uh, and transform the universities uh, now that uh, we're being forced to, let's uh, uh, take the initiative and do so. Thank you very much. Thank you very much as well. And giving this uh, perspective from uh, uh, a university, a private university with a very international focus in, uh, in Thailand about uh, how you look into the challenge, but at the same time, looking at the opportunities it creates for the future, uh, focusing on 
on change and innovation and uh, society issues uh, and uh, looking also at partnerships and international uh, uh, cooperation in uh, uh, in this new uh, encounter that we, uh, we face. Uh, I, I think already in the questions there was a lot of interest in your pipeline program. So uh, if you can give a link to that to people, that would be very much appreciated uh, for further background. But uh, thank you all three for your presentations. I will, uh, as I said, I will ask you uh, two questions uh, and then I give it back to uh, uh, Hilge to uh, moderate the questions and a lot of questions already made uh, from uh, from the audience. But before doing that, uh, I'll, two things I want to uh, to get your further opinion about. Uh, what wasn't uh, Tamara said in his presentation that the private sector in Ethiopia uh, will face probably the most, most challenges uh, uh, as a result of this. Uh, uh, I don't think so much the not-for-profit quality institutions like uh, St. Mary uh, and also not so much uh, uh, AIT in Thailand, uh, but there is a lot of uh, private higher education in the Global South, uh, for-profit, which uh, do you see this as a kind of clean-up of uh, the low-end quality and what would be the implications uh, if the private sector in higher education in the Global South uh, would really be affected strongly. What what would would that, would that mean? Can uh, maybe Marcelo also because Brazil has a very strong private higher education sector, but again many different uh, modalities within it. But uh, can you maybe start to see well what do you think uh, the implications would be? Would it indeed be the private sector mostly affected and uh, the consequence of that? Uh, Marcelo, can you? Tamrat was uh, trying to speak, but it's on mute, I think. Oh, okay. Okay. Tamrat. Yes. Can you hear Tamrat, me? Tamrat, can you start? Yeah, we can hear you now. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it, de it depends on what's happening now, and it depends on uh, what the government is planning for higher education in the future. If you're asking me what's exactly bothering the private higher education institutions now, now, there were uh, two major important things that uh, were happening within the sector that I did not uh, focus on earlier uh, during the discussion. One is, as uh, part of the community, private institutions and the public institutions were considered to be responsive to the public demand, to the uh, public campaign about helping the poor, sympathizing with the community and assisting in whatever uh, possible ways the combat uh, uh, against the, the uh, pandemic. I think private institutions have been part of this from the very start. And they have contributed a lot in terms of the areas that I, I uh, covered uh, earlier on. But uh, government also in the interest to protect uh, the individuals, uh, especially employees, came up with a state of emergency that uh, clearly indicated that uh, private uh, enterprises cannot lay off, cannot uh, reduce their their uh, staff. So basically, that meant uh, that would uh, directly have an impact on their on their income. Uh, if at all they uh, have to use certain strategies of survival, and secondly, uh, because of the response to the pandemic, uh, it was in the public in interest that private institutions should not continue asking for the same type of tuition and, 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 and fees. So the Association of Private Higher Education Institutions decided that uh, though there is this state of emergency, on their own accord, they, they reduced 25% of their income because the support, um, as many uh, can see, was limited. Uh, and uh, private institutions had you know, the response to, 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 to sympathize with, with the community. This meant a reduction in terms of their income. And many have already felt the strain. Some are uh, struggling to survive the first wave. Some have started reducing some staff against even the state of emergency rules and regulations. But this uh, would not pass as simple as that. Because if you close the private institutions or if they go bankrupt and close themselves, the impact would be uh, uh, larger than what we have currently private higher education institutions cover 17% of higher education enrollment in the country. 
So it would definitely affect this. Secondly, government intends that in the long run, whether affected by the pandemic or not, government intends that in the long run, they have lost the appetite to go into public uh, stream expansion. That would mean there will be more room for private institutions. So uh, if that's the case, the loss of certain institutions in the short and the medium term would mean a lot. In terms of investment as well, uh, due to some of the rules and regulations coming out and uh, due to you know the capacity the limited capacity of private higher education institutions investors may not be interested in the short or uh, uh, me, i mean uh, medium term to come into this volatile sector so in, in terms of that we will be damaging definitely the future of higher education within within the the country uh, that's that's my feeling okay, thank you Marcelo. Uh... From a Brazilian perspective, what do you think? Well, the, in fact, the problem that we face, of course, here we are we are uh, making a, a view from the higher education sector, but the the problem is the same in all sectors, in companies, in big companies, in small companies, in restaurants, in uh, in the state governments, in the municipalities. Everyone is really, really worried about the future and you know, of course in the education sector also the schools here the private schools they they, they are facing a very challenging times and uh, all this will will have to reshape this uh, all the sectors and of course the higher education sector here in brazil there are different models as well the public universities usually they have this model of having all the staff and faculty uh, uh, paid by the government. But this is not the case in the ca uh, in our situation. In the state of Sao Paulo, the three universities of the state of Sao Paulo, uh, we have a, a financial model that we have a, a, a fixed percentage of the tax revenues of the state. And uh, this works very well, well when the economy is going well, but it it works really bad when the economy is going uh, not well as as it's happening now because we are a public uh, public universities public sector and therefore we don't have any possibility to close anything we don't have any possibility to fire anyone our budget is, is limited but our payroll keeps growing every time so uh, the payroll is always at least constant and we can eventually uh, stop increasing but never decrease uh, we, we we have public servants here that we have to pay and not only that uh, we pay also the the retired faculty the retired staff and so the the the, the uh, payroll keeps growing so we are really really worried about the future just to mention numbers here at the University of Campinas, our budget now this week, uh, the, pre the provision for the budget uh, for, for the future was reduced for this year of about $50, $50 million. So this is something that will certainly affect us and we have to respond quickly in order to try not to, uh, to, 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 uh, to, to make any more loss for the for the staff for the faculty and so on so this is really really challenging as well for the public universities in different models that eventually exist in all, the, all over the world in the private sector the same situation happens all around the world and of course here in brazil here in brazil the difference is that the private sector is responsible for having more than 75 75 percent of the enrollments in the country. So it's a huge sector, more than, uh, I would say nowadays, more than 7 million students in the private sector in Brazil. And uh, the point is that the uh, uh, distance education was already growing very much. There are more than 1.5 million students uh, doing online courses in the country. So this is something that probably will uh, still grow and the, most of the uh, private universities have already a very good uh, infrastructure in order to deal with the online education. Uh, and I would say that this, this is probably something that will uh, uh, grow very much in the in near future. This is probably my opinion on that. Okay, thank you. 
Uh, Eden, do you want to add something about that? Yeah, uh, I, I just want to, uh, you know, uh, <clears throat> I, I am personally very depressed about what's happening, uh, you know, around the world. Uh, and also, of course, in Thailand, you know, Thailand, although, as I said, the number of cases seem okay, quote unquote, uh, but it has been devastating effect on the economy. Uh, Thailand depends heavily on tourism. Uh, almost 20% of the economy is on that. And now there are zero tourists uh, in the country. Uh, and uh, the, the uh, uh, average uh, person who uh, uh, sells on the street, uh, you know, their business went real down, really down. So if you depend on the local economy and students that can afford to come to your uh, university, um, you know, it's a big question mark uh, of this uh, uh, tuition costs, okay? Um, so in our case, um, I, I like to, uh, you know, always look on the bright side. And I think that one, uh, uh, one conjecture I put out here is that I think that actually, especially for us, which is so international and so, uh, uh, and recruit from so many countries, uh, we actually see uh, more applications this uh, spring than uh, double any time in our past history, okay? And I think that, I would think that probably maybe uh, a lot of those uh, Asian students would have gone to Europe, uh, would have gone to US, uh, would have gone to the UK. And now, you know, they either can't go or maybe they don't wanna go. Um, and uh, if you have something to offer, and obviously, you know, you don't want to people just come because they, they have nowhere else to go. Uh, you have to create value. You have to add value. And I still think that, uh, especially in our case here, since most of our uh, fields have to do with social impact, sustainability, capacity building, uh, development of the society, um, I think these are areas that are always going to be uh, very useful. And if we can provide value, uh, they can come now. Uh, I hope to be able to be in Dublin in November. Uh, you can ask me then how things go uh, for the fall semester. Maybe all this is false uh, optimism. Uh, but at this point anyway, uh, I, I think that uh, uh, we're, we're trying to do as best we can. On the outreach, I mentioned uh, we are suffering because we used to have government officials for, come in from Bangladesh. They come in from Bhutan. They come in from Nepal, come in from Myanmar, and now they're not coming. Uh, but we're... Uh, uh, switching to online, we're looking at new ways of engaging them uh, and uh, new ways of uh, uh, earning uh, revenue. Um, so a lot of work needs to be done because uh, the business model is just not going to be the same. And uh, campus services, which uh, also brings in money, uh, that is probably something that is not too, uh, uh, not as dependable. Uh, but uh, uh, I still am a believer in residential college, uh, and 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 I guess. Uh, uh, we're just going to continue to fight, and uh, uh, even though the the situation is is uh, ranges from dire to uh, uncertain, uh, especially for uh, uh, higher education. Thank you. Uh, so yeah, what what is clear from what you uh, all three say, uh, uh, your systems certainly in the global south need both uh, good uh, private higher education and good public higher education. It's, uh, um, that will be the challenge uh, for the future. Both public and uh, private higher education will be affected by the crisis and the, the economic impact that it has, but it uh, is important that uh, governments keep supporting uh, both sectors to, uh, to continue to deliver. Uh, we, uh, we have one and a half hour extra, uh, which our panelists have uh, promised to do, so we continue uh, with the session. Before giving the floor uh, to um, to Hill here, uh, and I step out. One last question about online education. Uh, uh, what you see is that uh, there's a lot of uh, concerns about the quality of this emergency online teaching. Uh, uh, access of students. Uh, students are not satisfied. Students have no access. Uh, faculty feel uncomfortable about it. Uh, there's a lot of criticism about that. There are people who say, well, this is a great game changer and everything will go online. The other people say, no, everybody goes back to on-site as soon as possible. And there are people who are somewhere in between. Uh, Marcelo, uh, in previous discussion that we had, you, you said we also have to look at the opportunities that this creates. Can you say something more about that? Sure. Uh, thank you. Well, my point is always that I... We are struggling with a, a very complicated situation because we have 
a lot of inequalities in our countries and well all over the world i would say that this is true but especially in our universities and uh, in fact uh, we tried to provide internet to provide uh, uh, equipment for the students and um, but this is sometimes not the uh, everything that they need for example they they maybe don't have any room for studying or they have a complicated environment in their homes and they there are so many factors that it are impossible to predict uh, on how this can uh, change the way the students uh, learn and how we interact with them. But the, the other, some other sides were, uh, are always uh, not seen. Uh, just to mention that the, these inequalities are also uh, present in our face-to-face -face education. Just to mention in, in big cities like uh, here in Sao Paulo, we have about let's say 20 million uh, inhabitants. Or here in Campinas, we have the city is a smaller one, uh, 1.2 million inhabitants in my city. But there are some students that take 2.5 to three hours to reach the university every single day. And so they took two buses, three buses to get to the university. And these students uh, have to go from home to the university and go back uh, during uh, a normal, let's say, normal day, they lose about five to six hours in uh, public transportation. Uh, for these students, if we are able to provide good internet connection and good equipment, they, they, they are having, maybe in some cases, they are having some uh, special occasion to, to, to reach a better level of education. You know, uh, so uh, this is something that we have to learn how to provide and how to deal with that in a in a in in a better uh, position. So, the, in my opinion, there are uh, studies missing about this point. So we should, in my personal opinion, we are trying to uh, to start now some uh, kind of uh, uh, research in order to 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 understand a little bit more the needs for the students, the situation of these students in each single environment and how uh, this uh, so-called new normal can really affect the lives of uh, all the students and how we can really take some lessons for, 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 uh, for having a better education. Just to mention that there is a, a, a tendency all around the world, a trend around the world to use this uh, so-called uh, hybrid uh, education or uh, uh, try to, to, read, to, to use the time in classrooms uh, more efficiently than we are doing here, at least in Brazil and in Latin America as a whole. So we should uh, try to uh, better use the, uh, what, uh, the resources that we have in online education and try to get that for, for our students in a, in a better uh, way. So this is more or less what I wanted to say. So we, we should try to, to, to take from this, uh, from this case that we are facing uh, the best solutions and try to understand how they really, how the students are facing this situation during this pandemic. This is my uh, personal opinion about that. Okay, thank you. And uh, as you said as well, of course, what we learn from this kind of activities like webinars that uh, it's also possible uh, to bring in international perspectives in the classroom uh, by using uh, the online facility. So uh, that we now have an audience of uh, over 200 people in this webinar from all over the world. And that we have experts from uh, uh, Latin America, Africa and from Asia uh, in this uh, panel. Uh, that we can also use in the classroom and bringing in the international dimension into the classroom online instead of uh, only focusing on a very small elite that is mobile. So uh, that's another opportunity that we can see. Uh, I will now uh, go out and uh, then uh, Hilge comes in and she will try to address some of the many questions that we have been uh, getting uh, for this webinar and your response to that. So. Uh, Hilke, the... Thank you, Hans. Um, so here I'm back in. Thank you for these very interesting presentations. And I think that uh, 
I can echo here what all the participants also reported in the chat box that they very much liked uh, the very well pre prepared presentations and so also the complementarity of your presentations. There is one, um, there are a few questions that are already raised in, in those that were um, addressed to you by Hans, uh, but there, there is one that comes to mind uh, throughout your presentations and also through the discussion that you just had. And that's the one uh, uh, of the university working together uh, working together among themselves, and I was wondering um, how much of attention was given to that uh, when you talk about the University of uh, Campinas or the AIT or uh, St. Mary's universities. How much do you actually work with your peers in your own country um, or on your own continent uh, from your own um, 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 motivation, let's say, or also throughout organizations? That was one of the questions that was asked. To what extent is there a joint response to the current uh, pandemic? Um, the floor is yours. Who would like to, to take that question? Well, uh, well if you, uh, uh, my, my, I would say that in the initial phase of this pandemic, everyone is really focused on in the internal uh, the internal problems that we are facing at the universities. Everyone is really, really busy trying to adapt and trying to, to, to conform to this new, to new situation. But now that the situation is, you know, after a few months, uh, you start working together with other organizations. But the initial is a point, I, I, I don't know, I don't have energy, or I would say that most of the people don't have time or energy to, to, to try to connect and work and, and make a, a long meetings in order to, to, to try to, to, to convey something in, in, in groups. Of course, here in Brazil, we are trying to do uh, regarding the public perception, you know, the public dissemination of science and technology, and we are working in a group of different records. But it's, and of course, trying to, 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 to work in associations. I know that the private uh, universities are working hard in order to, to get some extra funding and so on. Uh, of course, trying to, to protect the sector. But I think it's, uh, at the beginning, it was just trying to adapt for for this new situation. Now, probably this uh, 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 this group um, uh, behavior will start to happen more frequently. Yeah, my question was also because you're struggling so much, and then I will give the floor to uh, Eden first. But my question is also since you've been struggling so much to identify the proper responses to. What do you do if you have to move online? What do you do if you cannot have the face-to-face -face mode for exams? Where do you find the best uh, examples of how to actually uh, move to the next steps? That, that It's also, I believe, uh, from the questions that I see in the chat box, one of the questions, how do you fuel your own energy with the energy that you can find it with, your, with your colleagues uh, throughout? But uh, um, I give the floor to Eden. Yeah. Um, again, if you look at opportunity, there is one thing I think that this crisis uh, does. Um, it brings the administration and the faculty and the staff uh, really together, okay? Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, I was a vice president at Hong Kong University of Science and Technology, as you know, for seven years. Um, and uh, I worked very well with the faculty, but I was involved in the internationalization. Uh, and uh, often I get a feeling that somehow uh, going to conferences and uh, forging international uh, relationships is sort of the administration job uh, where the faculty just does their own research and then they just uh, deal with their own uh, uh, research counterparts. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and it's sort of uh, like two different levels. But now I think that there is a convergence because there is a recognition that um, survival is at stake and that internationalization uh, is uh, changed. So it isn't just going to conferences, uh, by the administrators is really the faculty, uh, you know, realizing, for example, I set up this uh, uh, PPP, uh, you know, the, uh, the pipeline pi partnership program, the faculty are very interested and they are very supportive and they're helping us identify uh, universities where they work with and to see if we can uh, uh, conduct some sort of a dual degree, joint degree program. So, so to me, uh, and secondly, I, I had mentioned earlier that online education I think this blended learning uh, 
really, you know, is something that has been talked about ever since, uh, you know, edX and Coursera uh, got started, you know, seven, eight years ago. Uh, but, uh, uh, you know, it was uh, not too welcome by, by faculty, by many faculty. But now I think that they see uh, that um, actually uh, it does work uh, and uh, we can make it better uh, and they can do better. Uh, and, and so that uh, they see that in the future is going to be mixed so, so that, you know, uh, online could be an online exchange. So we don't have to go to uh, uh, University of Campinas, which, by the way, I visited your campus, uh, but um, we can uh, have faculty from there teaching and, uh, and doing online courses together. Uh, to me, there's, uh, there's many, many more uh, different ways, new ways of, uh, of uh, uh, using each other's uh, international presence. Uh, and to me, this is actually, uh, you know, uh, a good thing for Asia and Africa, uh, Latin America, so that we get to keep more of the students uh, in at home, okay, rather yeah. than have them just uh, uh, go away. Uh, but yeah. still, uh, it only works if you provide value, okay. Uh, and yeah, it only thank works you. I, if your I, I think I think model, that yeah. if your business Absolutely. model works, okay, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think you are. You will owe the all of the participants uh, uh, a document to explain in writing what this PPP, the 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 specific pipeline partnership program is all about. Because okay, you I'll received many questions about that one, so you will have more work at the issue of this webinar. That's that's for one, and and the participants can count on me to uh, get back to you to ask if you could write a bit of that uh, down because it's interesting uh, indeed to learn more about it. But um, we'll uh, Tamat, what would you like to say to this? I think the natural reaction uh, essentially comes, as my friend said, from the institution itself, because institutions are different in their nature, resources, priorities. So the first reaction naturally you would expect to come is from the institution. If you ask me about my institution, for instance, immediately after uh, the closure, what we did was we set up three task forces, which we called awareness raising, uh, online education, and institutional continuity. So the awareness was more about our students and the community. The online education was uh, getting us familiar with uh, the way how we would be able to deliver you know, uh, education from a distance. The institutional continuity, uh, all of these were led by vice president. The institutional continuity was checking back on our institutional plans and looking at what possible alternatives there are to continue uh, doing those. But this doesn't necessarily mean that it should stop there, as you said. Fortunately, in Ethiopia, we have the Ministry of Science and Higher Education, uh, led by uh, former professors in the universities, who have taken the initiative to coordinate such efforts at a national level. So they have set up something like seven uh, task groups, which include awareness raising, educational delivery, resource funding, and what have you. And this uh, has a group of people from the diaspora and from, from the universities uh, and from the uh, research institutions as well. So that, that group has been supporting almost all institutions uh, in terms of ideas, in terms of res uh, seeking resources, and in terms of you know sharing experiences. At the private higher education level, we have what we call an association for private higher education institutions. We engage through that association with the ministry, and the ministry has been positive to listen to our uh, challenges and assist wherever it's possible. For instance, very recently, uh, they have agreed to avail the national ICT resource for private higher education institutions as well. So there needs to definitely there needs to be, uh, as you said, a cooperative effort uh, from the local, institutional, national, regional, and even uh, global level in terms of generating ideas and in terms of searching for resources and availing that to the community and the student and staff of your institution. Yeah, this is very interesting because indeed uh, it is also responding to a question that was raised by Eden Wun himself. When you said what can organizations themselves do to assist the universities where, as Marcello says, you're so much busy with, with organizing your own institution that you hardly have time to even look into what others maybe have to offer. So it's really a catch-22 there. You, you, you solve an issue here. There may have been opportunities. 
before you understand the opportunities and the others who other ways or 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 um, um, guidelines or or methods that you could have used it takes time with of time with uh, that is really also very peculiar to this uh, crisis response in in order to to maintain uh, the the quality of the education for all to address all the issues that you have at the end but organizations like uh, the As um, association of african universities the association of latin american universities or asian they also, uh, we know because we organize um, a virtual global meeting of, meetings of associations where we exchange on the kind of support that each is trying to provide and offer. Uh, we know that, that all of them are working around the clock to also provide for assistance. It's a matter to get it to all of you in the way that is digestible immediately and then for the medium and for the long term. Um, as well, there was a, a, a series of questions on the future of internationalization, and I would like to, um, to leave those questions actually to the webinar that is taking place next week. I know you, would, you already uh, would have a lot to say. You said a lot in your actually uh, Eden uh, and also Marcello, because obviously all three of your institutions do count on um, a fueling of, uh, of the knowledge base through uh, incoming students and outgoing students. So the, this dynamics of internationalization, even though it can be picked up by um, online means, uh, will remain a big question. And there is a lot of uh, discussion on the future of internationalization. So maybe just one word, but let's leave the full discussion uh, to the webinar next week. And since time is always ticking too fast, there was another big question that came up a few times in the chat box, and that was the question uh, that you actually raised, uh, Marcello. It's of a different nature, so you will have two two minutes each to respond to two very different questions, the one on internationalization and the other one on the faculty. Um, you said, um, Marcello, that um, at the university, since it's a public institution, you have your tied to the fact that each and everyone inside the institution is a public servant and there is nothing you can do in terms of regulating, organizing, reorganizing your institution, even though you will be faced with huge uh, financial um, consequences of the pandemic. Uh, but what then is it that you do with your staff? Because the staff in, um, um, and the faculty themselves are very worried about their future. They know uh, that uh, the the institution will suffer in many different ways, and so what is it that that you can do that you would wish to do, and how do you engage with governments in uh, advising on the future of higher education as well? So that's only one part, and I would have loved to ask one other question, but we'll see if we get to that. Those two points. Uh, back to you. So maybe start with Marcello because you were well, okay, uh, already. Well, thank you. Uh, well, I will try to be, be uh, really quick about that. The, the issue of internationalization was really, really already addressed by, by uh, uh, the previous speakers. And I think there are some lessons that we have to face and, and really learn about. So you that are, for example, just to mention the International Association of Universities, we would make this uh, seminar in a very nice conference. Uh, it would probably take uh, 200 people that we had here, but it would cost uh, thousands and thousands of dollars and many hours of trips of 200 people around the world to attend a conference. And of course, it's nice to meet, it's nice to, to drink together and to, to have a, a lunch together. But uh, here we have the opportunity to, to have almost 200 people from all over the world, students participating, uh, having the chance to discuss in a in a very interesting manner. So I would say that this kind of uh, uh, learning that we, ha we have now from this perspective of, of having more online opportunities is really interesting for internationalization as well. And we should use that in the, in the future, even if the situation returns to, to their normal. So this is something that it, at the universities, we should try to learn more and to make more discussions with people abroad and to make more webinars and so on. That is really blooming uh, right now. 
from the perspective that uh, you asked about the, the government issue and how to deal with the, the, the situation of the staff, of course, the, every place is completely different in many places. And, and we don't know the future yet. The, the future is really, really uncertain. The state is really facing a very complicated times in terms of, 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 of money as, as well, the financial problem as well. So we are discussing with the government almost every day. Uh, we, we have meetings and we, we are trying to solve this situation. We don't know what will going to happen. In fact, we never faced a situation like this before. And so we have now a, a, a lot, uh, some money to survive the rest of the year. But of course, the next year will be a, a, a very big, big problem. So we don't know how the, the solution will be, but it probably have to deal with uh, the government, the, the state government, the, the federal government, and of course, uh, a pact among the, the society in order to solve this situation. We really don't know what is going to happen. And really, really, I, I follow my colleagues I am personally very depressed and, and very much worried about the future of, of uh, not only the higher education sector, but all over the country and the countries and the world as a whole. So sorry about finishing with this more depressing moment, but it's, it's the reality that we are facing right now. Yeah, but then I will add a little question to the others as well. Do you also see in your countries and in your regions a new people, uh, a new new faculty coming up with a strong voice where they, they provide for solutions uh, that can be considered by the society because there is this, uh, this, this depression that is uh, above all, but there are voices out there that are also those who have a, a real capacity to look into the future uh, with many different options. So maybe that question you take on as well when you, when you take the floor. Uh, Eden, would you like to take this one? The internationalization and the, uh, the, the, the link between the universities and the governments. Yeah, internationalization, um, as I said, um, I'm still a believer in face-to-face -face and residential education. I don't think online or webinar or uh, uh, Zoom is going to replace that. However, I have to admit, this working from home the last two months have been highly efficient uh, with the uh, meetings uh, being held. Uh, online, uh, much more efficient than I had uh, expected. Uh, so that I think that when we do go back to uh, to uh, not normal, but a new normal, I think that uh, uh, some of this online uh, usage uh, is going to stay. Uh, and I think the internationalization, as I said earlier, sort of online uh, uh, joint delivering of lectures uh, is going to be more. The, the key is, is how to uh, monetize this and how, to, how does the business model work? Uh, if uh, 200 of us don't fly, what does that do to the airline industry? Uh, and uh, what, what about the, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, the other aspects uh, of, uh, uh, of uh, not being able to see each other that is, uh, uh, that's missing, uh, that actually, uh, you know, the, the financial generation, the, the generation of resources, of revenue, uh, is, is something that must be looked at uh, at the same time as you explore uh, other ways of uh, working together, uh, you know, whether you can do joint degrees, uh, you know, for the alliance to offer a degree, uh, you know, any one of these uh, more creative ideas, uh, you have to uh, uh, look at those along with a financial uh, aspect. Uh, and, and I think that right now, all the universities uh, have not uh, make the break. Uh, they haven't done the leap of faith. Yeah. They, they have all talked about this, but... Uh, they're still counting their uh, uh, their money uh, and and really haven't taken the bold step, uh, and so um, we, we'll see. Uh, I don't have any uh, uh, solutions, but uh, but I do have a feeling that uh, we'll come up with something, and uh, you know. Yeah, we're good. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, very good. Can I give you the floor, uh, Wood Wonson? Uh, I would uh, start with the link between the government and the universities. If, if you talk in terms of Africa or, or, or Ethiopia, I would say that the economic impact of the pandemic would be critical to the continuity of the institutions and even to the continuity of the economic dynamism Africa has been exhibiting in the last two decades. So what I would say is whatever is done in the economic uh, sphere, 
would determine the fate of different sectors, including the higher education sector. So uh, African governments have been requesting for debt cancellation. A uh, little bit of debt relief has, has been already offered, but we would, we would lose all that dynamism we have had for two decades. And if that means the case, higher education and other sectors would definitely be threatened. And the government would not have any opportunity of supporting uh, higher education institutions when it has, you know, competing demands from the health sector, from uh, the, the uh, you know, income earning sectors, the business sectors. So that that is a serious issue that should be globally addressed. There have been certain uh, uh, provisions, there have been certain good gestures, but enough has not been done at the global level, I would say. I'm not an economist, but that's what I would see. And secondly, if there is any any problem in this area, Africa's uh, promising areas like postgraduate education, research collaboration, international engagements would also be threatened. If you look at the way research is done within African uh, institutions, it mostly relies on the cooperation of uh, the, the, the North partners. And that would mean a lot in terms of uh, uh, losing uh, to, to, to this pandemic. So I would say that uh, whatever happens in the economic sphere would have a direct influence into the individual lives and into the into the fate of the higher education institutions as well. It's too early. Uh, I mean, it is, we, we need to engage as a global community as early as possible into addressing these problems. On top of that, uh, I, I, I also see that uh, though humanitarian organizations and international organizations are trying to address uh, the problems with regard to lives and livelihoods. I don't see enough. Uh, I may not be aware of this. Uh, in terms of what the IT giants are doing, uh, in terms of assisting uh, the problems uh, of online education in the third world. So I think uh, that kind of support would have to be another stream where a lot should come from IT giants, even access to such a meeting fora in Africa would not be uh, a simple issue. So uh, if there is this global uh, support, uh, national uh, readiness and regional cooperation, I think all of these can be addressed and we can see a brighter future. Okay, that is very interesting. And uh, yes, we 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 will. I I wanted to get back also to Marcello because I can see where also the uh, the difficulty and the difficult future uh, is actually at at your at your door or in in your homes. It is a very difficult time. Uh, but you also uh, seem to indicate that. Universities are so incredibly active that governments will not indeed be able to, to do without, and that is a good thing. Um, what many ask is, is how to build better bridges and make and get through to uh, government officials even better to somehow to, to make the case for, um, for support and strong support for, um, oh, sorry about that one, and strong support uh, to uh, the institutions into the future so that um, all the, the different um, facets of what universities have to offer will help rebuild our societies to the better. Um, it, it is, it's easier said than done. So what the IAU can only offer is to help support the dialogue about this on and on again, and maybe in the next series of webinars, um, bring to the table a mix of academics and, and decision makers of different kinds and different stakeholders in society. So that, uh, that is already uh, pen penciled down on our agenda, but uh, that's probably where we will need to go as well. Um, there are a few questions about, um, about so many other aspects of what you've been touching uh, on, but unfortunately our time is up. So if I can go round the, the, the table very quickly and ask you for your last word on this webinar and then invite everyone uh, to join in for the webinar on internationalization next week, 19 May. Uh, also reassuring everyone who has asked that indeed the uh, webinar this time again has been recorded, uh, that it will be shared with everyone uh, and you will have the opportunity to, um, to, to, to use the link that we have to share it also in your community.
communities because maybe that is a good thing to do as well to to share the kind of discussion that we're having with the many those who didn't make it to our virtual room as well to even maximize beyond uh, um, the, the possibility of this webinar uh, into uh, your community so one last word maybe Marcello, you're muted. No, I am. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Yes. Uh, thank yes. you very much for inviting me. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for the opportunity. And my point is that exactly what you mentioned. So here we have the opportunity to talk to all over the world, to discuss in a, in a general framework, but always within our bubble and within the people interested in higher education, we all believe and we all strongly believe that the higher education is the solution for the future of humanity. So we have to read the society as a whole. This is my personal opinion that the future. So we should now try to make an extra effort in order to reach society, to reach politicians, to reach everyone to show that the uh, investment in higher education is the only way that we can face this pandemic the, the next ones that will probably come and have a better future for the humanity. So this is my uh, last uh, uh, intervention, is that we should, as a universities, focus more and more on communication with society uh, in order to uh, show that this is the only way that we, the, um, the society, the humanity, the world would have a possible future. Thank you very much. Thank you. Eden? Well, I just uh, repeat that uh, I think that internationalization is uh, as opposed to being damaged uh, because of the uh, uh, virus. Uh, I think that we have to redouble the effort, uh, not only because of the education, but because of the reasons that Marcello has mentioned, because I think um, uh, what is uh, uh, perhaps more depressing than just the virus itself is how the uh, geopolitics and the uh, uh, nationalistic tendencies have uh, uh, risen uh, and so that global co collaboration and global uh, uh, camaraderie uh, really is at a low point uh, these days uh, and I think that uh, this calls for more creative ways of uh, using universities to uh, get together and, and share messages and share uh, ideas. Uh, to me this is more important than, uh, uh, than ever and, and one final point is that uh, I think that for Asia, for Latin America, uh, for uh, Africa, uh, I would look at this as a uh, uh, as a opportunity, and uh, uh, not just the uh, the old business model uh, of the uh, uh, lineup uh, of the universities uh, uh, around the world. There's a you know Chinese word, as you know, many of you know, uh, crisis. The word Chinese is made up of uh, you know two characters. Uh, one is uh, uh, danger. And the other one is uh, opportunity. So let's, uh, uh, I would just end my uh, uh, comments on that note. <laughs> Thank you. That's a good, wise, wise way to end. Uh, on Woodson, please, the word uh, is yours. As I said earlier on, uh, with all the problems that uh, the pandemic has brought to the world, it has also given us uh, a new opportunity in terms of proving ourselves as frontline institutions, frontline institutions which have been involved in ensuring the very existence of human species, human lives. And there is no best or better service than this. And I say, uh, we are in this together and we need to move uh, together as well. The African word Ubuntu catches it all. Ubuntu. Yes, exactly. Thank you. Yes, wonderful. I would like uh, also on behalf of Hans uh, De Witt, uh, Giorgio Mar Marinoni, uh, Katarina Minaiva, and the President Pam Fredman, who was with us uh, with a few questions, uh, I'd like to thank you for these excellent presentations. Uh, it will be our pleasure of all to also uh, look at the webinar again and listen to your presentations. They were very inspiring. And I just hope that this is only the beginning of more uh, discussion along the lines that you've just set out. So thank you very much for your time, uh, availability and, and uh, expertise that you shared with us. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank IAU. 
Have a nice day or evening or night. Yes. <laughs> to you. Goodbye. Bye. Uh, back out working.